Uh, hi, my name is Robin Windsor, and I'm most known for being a professional dancer on Strictly Come Dancing. Wonderful, wonderful. So where did your passion for um, dance and performing come from then? Um, well, uh, my parents used to teach ballroom dancing in the local ballroom dance school in Ipswich, where I'm from. So despite that weird Australian um, twang that I've got to my accent, I'm actually a Suffolk boy. Um, and I was always at the dance studio from when I was very young. And uh, I just loved moving to music. And uh, they caught me wiggling my hips in the mirror um, when I was about three years old and uh, asked me if I wanted a dance lesson. And I jumped at the chance. Amazing, amazing. So did you have any other influences then when you were growing up? Was there a particular style of music that you liked? Um, I liked all music in general, but because I was in a ballroom dancing environment, um, I was hearing Latin music all the time and brought Latin and ballroom music. And I loved the, the, the rhythms and things of, a, of, la, of the Latin beat um, and I just loved moving to it. Um, I, will, I think I would have been a dancer regardless of... Um, if I was in that environment or not, just luckily, or so it turned out I was in a boring environment, so I ended up moving in that direction. Yeah, sure. So you said that your parents kind of taught. Were they really like, um, they wanting you to do it or did they kind of go, mm, I'm not sure? Well, of course they, they wanted me to do it, but they weren't pushy parents. They were just like, yeah. if I wanted to do it, then they would help me do what I wanted to do. And being a boy um, that turned out to be very good at a young age, I had the choice of who I wanted to dance with because obviously there's so many girls um, yeah. compared to boys. Um, so I, I was able to get the best partners. And before I knew it, I was England's number one by the time I was probably about 13, 14. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's crazy. So once you kind of achieve something like that, then how do you set your goals and, and the bars and stuff like that? Well, growing up, we really all we wanted to be was in the ballroom dancing world. There was no other world to us. We are separate from ballet, jazz, tap and all of the other sort of styles that they do. So our ballroom world is very small and our aim is just to become world champion. That is what that was at the end. That was all that was available to us. Um, so we'd start to work our way up. And then I turned from junior, which is under 16 to under 19 to the youth. Um, and me and my dance partner became England's number one really quickly. It was a dance with a different girl then. Um, and we went to represent England at the World Championships um, and we made the top 12. Um, and then um, I sort of started to uh, lose a little interest, not interest in the dancing, but my commitment wasn't up to scratch. I was going through issues with my sexuality. I didn't know what was going on. Um, so I sort of took a step back from dance and my dance partner uh, decided that because I wasn't committed enough, and she didn't know why at the time, um, she decided to dance with somebody else. <laughs> so at that time, I just moved to London, um, like a 19 year old guy uh, that was just coming out. And um, I ended up just putting my dance shoes up for a bit because I, it was so expensive and I couldn't ask my parents to pay for anything else. Um, and little did I realise I was getting into huge amounts of debt. Um, yeah. But what did I do? Did I stop dancing or did I continue um dancing and get myself into more debt so I thought you know what I'm going to take a break so I took a year, I took a year out okay so you talked there about kind of like the commitment and stuff of dance it's very um full-on isn't it uh, when you're trying to hold down like three part-time jobs um to be able to compete um because of the amount of time I needed off of work I could never hold down a job because they wouldn't let you have the time off so it was just anything from did washing dishes in a hotel at three in the morning um well I worked in various shoe shops um bars restaurants clubs everything um just because we had to fight fit in the training and the time to be able to do competitions yeah for sure and you train for many many hours right as many as you can fit in um yeah. and literally some some days it was like do we spend the money on a practice session or do we eat tonight and it was a little bit like that back then and it was really really tough um but it was all part of the process for for us and sort of put us in good stead for later in life because it made me appreciate yeah. much more as I got older yeah I was just gonna say did it um obviously at the time it becomes quite overwhelming doesn't it but do you think it it kind of um like you say stood you in good stead and, and made you think about things that maybe you didn't think about or you wouldn't have thought about if if it weren't for what you were doing yeah I'm much I'm just much more appreciative and understanding than yeah than perhaps say with somebody who's done stuff without the hard work that's just given a platform I feel yeah, like yeah. I've worked my way up and given my dues to 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 make that happen 
Yeah, for sure. So um, talk us through then when you stopped dancing, what made you um, get back to it? Um, I started to suffer a little bit with anxiety and depression um, back when I was around 1920 from not dancing really because dancing was always always and I realized this later in life was my escapism from anything that was going wrong um and I'd chuck myself into the London sort of party scene just to take my mind off of everything and yeah. I literally bumped into my dance partner that ended up with me to dance with somebody else on Oxford Street uh, which was a shock because she lives in Southampton um okay. I literally bumped into each other and she was quite honest and I needed telling. It was like, you look terrible, Robin. You need to, to do something. And I said, I don't know what, what to do. And she said, I've got an idea. She said, I want to dance, but I don't want to compete anymore. Um, and I said, yeah, I'm quite at that sort of stage. I just want to dance. And she said, well, why don't you come and live with me and my family in Southampton? This is without asking her parents. Uh, <laughs> why don't you come with us? And um, we'll get some stuff together. She needed to lose some weight. I needed to put some weight on. And so we said, let's help each other, spend a few months um, getting things together, and we can perhaps go on some cruise ships and do shows and things like that. And I was like, do you know what? This is the perfect thing for me. Um, so I went down to Southampton, and um, six months down there, the day that we sent off the VHS tapes, because it was that long ago, um, <laughs> to all the cruise liners, uh, we got a phone call from a show called Burn the Floor which before Strictly, it was the ultimate dance show. Dance show. And um, they actually called Coralie and said, we've got a, a boy for you to dance with. And she said, look, I'd love to do it, but I have to do it with Robin because I'm dancing with him and we spent all this time together and blah, blah, blah. So they said, fine, bring him with you. We remember him. Um, so yeah. then I ended up going on a 10-year world tour with uh, Burn the Floor, which I thought I would only be with for six months. Ten years later, I was still touring the world um, and we ended up um, being the first ever ballroom show to be on Broadway in New York. That's um, incredible. Supposed to be there for three months, but got extended twice um, and ended up spending nine months there um, breaking box office records at the Long Acre Theatre. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So how did that feel then, knowing that, you know, six months prior to that point, you were like, I'm not doing it anymore? I feel very blessed and I'm a very big believer of being in the right place at the right time. Um, because if that meeting with Coralie had never happened, I wouldn't be here. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's such a strange world because there are so many people with talent. Um, but I think it's all about being in the right place at the right time and the universe will put you there. And I've, I'm a big believer at that because it's yeah. happened to me so many times. Um, uh, but to be the first show on Broadway, it was very surreal because our goal in life was to be world champion. Um, we never really thought about going to Broadway because it was just something that wasn't heard of. Ballroom dancers yeah. didn't go to Broadway. Uh, so we sort of broke broke the seal there. Um, it was hard because obviously they require a thousand percent every single night. That Every single show is just vital to perform the performance. And we had people like J-Lo and Meatloaf and Matt Damon, Catherine Zeta jones all coming to watch the show. And it was just so surreal. Yeah. Uh, but after a, a lengthy spell on Broadway, um, I sort of said to myself, well, what's next? Because this is the pinnacle of anything for a dancer. Um, and I ended up being on a phone call uh, with the producers of Strictly Come Dancing. And um, they just happened to be looking for a British guy, um, a bit of a rough looking, that was probably a bit kind at heart. And it turned out that I was exactly what they wanted. And my name had cropped up a few times for them. And um, little did I realise that uh, uh, the next day I was going to get a call to say, you're on the show. Wow. Oh, my God. So did you have to fly from America then straight to doing? I flew I flew from America uh, for an interview. I literally yeah. flew straight from the airport, straight to the interview at, uh, at the BBC. And I looked terrible because I was tired and it was just like, uh, 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 and I, they didn't even ask to see me dance. So I presume that they'd already done a bit of research and found stuff of me. Uh, and they just got me on camera. I wanted to see what I was like and pretty much just offered me the job. And I was like, oh, God, TV had never been in my realm of something to do either. Um, yeah. And they just happened to be looking for three new boys um, to replace some of the old ones. Um, 
and that I was then thrust into prime time uh, television on BBC One. Well, and how does that differ then? Because obviously you'd had the the difference between the competing and then in front of a, a live audience every night, and then you're going on to doing television, which is different again. You know how how did you cope with that? And also, you know what what challenges do you do did you face doing that? Um. At first, I was just, I'm very, I have a lot of self-doubt and I was very like, I don't know if I'm cut out for this before it started. And I was like getting so paranoid that I was going to be a disappointment. And I really only wanted to impress my mother because she'd given me all of her money growing up so that I could dance. Um, and it was her favourite show. What is her favourite show? Um, and I was all right. I, uh, you've got an audience there with you. Um, so I treated it as if it was doing a show in a theatre. Um, and then all of a sudden the red light came on on the camera and I realised that there were nearly 10 million people watching me and my heart just went <laughs> straight. <in> my... <laughs> and um, as a result, uh, the first dance I did on Strictly, the celeb was Patsy Kensett. And um, in our personal world, she was trying to go too fast. So we'd gone off time and I knew it as a professional. If I added an extra spin, that'll put us back on time. But of course, the celebrities don't know that. And I just pulled her off of her feet and it was a bit of a disaster. Um, but I actually made her think it was her fault because if I let her believe it was my fault, she'd lose all her trust in me. Yeah. Well, I had to think of another way around. So I actually blamed her for it. <laughs> this patsy i'm so sorry but it was the only way for you to keep trusting me yeah yeah and that's the thing when you're working with a partner how did you feel um working with somebody who was a complete beginner because you were always used to even growing up you know that you were of the same ilk of the same level how did how did that work for you and also you kind of put on your teacher shoes a bit there yeah it's, it's a massive challenge i mean i was lucky for my first three celebs on strictly were all actresses all, all soap actresses actually um so uh they've all been to stage school they all knew how what the commitment was like they all knew how to count move to um, count and eight count to eight and move to, to one two three four hit hit they knew how to do all that of course they didn't know any ballroom um so i'm just teaching them from the beginning um the first year i was very like oh my god i'm about to be patsy kenzer um <laughs> Just for me, she was the biggest name on the show that year. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is just like so surreal. And then you sort of realise after about three or four weeks of teaching them, you realise they're just normal people. Um, yeah, they have yeah. a job, yes, on television. And you've seen them all the time. But you start to realise that they're just like everybody else. Um, they have the same problems. Um, nothing's easy. And um, it was it was very re rewarding um, at yeah. once you see that what you've created for a Saturday night and you go back and watch it you think you know what I did that and yeah. I've made them do that and they are so happy and Patsy lost two and a half stone um, and she left a very happy customer <laughs> yeah for sure so talk us through like a highlight of yours for from being on the show is there one particular standout moment that you have or um, every every day was a blessing um, yeah. but I think of course my very first dance with Lisa Riley, um, everybody was like, even herself said that everybody's going to think that I'm the joke contestant because I'm a big girl. She was a size 30 back then. Um, and there was no joke contestant that year. There's always that funny one. So we all assumed it was going to be her. And when I got paired with her, I was just went home and my, to my partner at the time, I was like, what am I going to do? I'm not Anton. Anton's the funny one. I, I'm not funny. I'm just, you know. Um, and it turned out I didn't need to be the funny one because yeah. she came out there to prove that you don't have to be a certain size to be able to dance. And that's yeah, what she yeah. wanted. And she um, um, was the first female celebrity to lift the mail. And that was on the front page of every paper the next day. And um, it was it was the t turning point of everything for me because I stopped being, oh, it's that guy from Strictly to, oh, my God, that's Robin Windsor. And yes. That, that for me was the turning point yeah absolutely that's wonderful so after you finished strictly then you know what did you move on to do how did you um keep up the dancing what what was your next level for you well i had sadly i had to leave strictly under a very difficult circumstance because um i had a little bit of an accident and didn't realize at the time but i popped two discs in my lower back and um i was having injections um so while i was having those injections 
I did uh, Burn the Floor again, had invited me to headline the West End with Christina. So it was like full circle. Yeah. Um, and I danced with Deborah Meaden and did the tour, strictly tour with Deborah Meaden at that point, all while having injections in my back to keep me going. Uh, what I didn't realise that the injections were masking the pain mm -hmm. and the discs were moving further out. And eventually when those injections wore off for the third time, I hit the floor, which was a week before Strictly started. Um, so they had to replace me at last minute and I just didn't go ever back again, which I thought was very sad and yeah. was very disappointed in them for that because yeah. I'd gone through a, a lot with my injury, but I was perfect in perfect health. Um, yeah. I'd done all the rehabilitation and I was back to normal. Mm. So I thought, what am I going to do? Um, luckily, um, I was approached by a theatre company um, uh, to join a show of theirs called Putting on the Ritz. And I toured the UK for a whole year um, with Christina I'm doing a show called Putting on the Ritz. Yeah. <laughs> um, and after that, the same company wanted to do an, another show, but with me, really, um, called Keep Dancing. And they loved the ballroom side of things because Putting on the Ritz was a, a, a tribute almost to ballroom, but back in the 1920s and 30s and things like yeah. that. So they wanted to do a current dance show. And uh, we got that on the road. I went on the road for a year um, and I danced with Anya Garnis, who was also a Strictly pro. Uh, she made the semi-final with Patrick Robinson uh, back in th 2013, I think. Um, and it was all going very well. Um, but I suffered quite badly with depression and anxiety. It's something that I hadn't had for a long time. And when I lost my job on Strictly, I'd, my uh, engagement had ended and financial things had gone wrong. and All of those things came together and it wasn't going very well. And this was happening yeah. on the tour. Yeah. Um, so things were getting really, really bad and you'd get into a very dark place. Um, so then I took a break from everything at the end of the Keep Balance yeah. tour. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's really difficult, isn't it, when you get into that... Um get into that place where you just want to keep going it's like a hamster wheel isn't it and then you you step off and you think oh my goodness you know I, but it's the hardest thing to step off but it's the best thing you, you you need to step off yeah the staying on it it's just like keep brushing things under the carpet as you go yeah. eventually you're going to trip over that carpet because the, the mound is going to get too high and sadly i did and it almost yeah. ended very very badly um but we do with the help of some very good friends um, nobody knew what was going on because, of course, to the public, I'm of course. all happy when you're at work, you switch it on. It's when you're yeah. at home that people don't realise the things that are going on. Um, yeah. So eventually I got the courage to deal. Well, I got to a point where I had no choice but to deal with it um, yeah. and spend some time getting myself back together, which was very difficult but rewarding in the end. And mm -hmm. I then thought to myself, I want to use that as a way to help others. Um, but I need some time away for me. So I decided to go back on the road and do a fair, what I called my farewell tour and yeah. um, take around the country my life story on stage, um, which was amazing. And uh, I was convinced by the charity that I was working with called Sane um, to share my story, all of it, because it would help others and it would help me. So I stood on stage every night and told my story in floods of tears. And it was uh, it was really tough, but the rewarding because at stage door you'd have parents or kids, and my, my my son's going through this or this, and thank you so much. You don't know any idea how that helps. And then as the tour went on, I wasn't getting so upset by telling my story every night, so it was getting better and better and better for me. And they were quite right. Um, and I finished with my very final show uh, was on the West End. I thought, what a way to finish, and I had. Uh, 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 an amalgamation of celebrity guests uh, coming on, so West End royalty like Kerry Ellis, Rachel John from Hamilton, there was Gabby Roslin, um, Ali Bastian, Chizzy, who done Strictly, Anya Garners, Pasha, um, Vincent Simone, and loads and loads of people came to give me a send off because I was off uh, to St. Lucia for, well, permanently. Yeah. I took a job, a place there called The Body Holiday. Um, to be their entertainment manager and I went out there and uh, after six months I kind of had enough and done what they've required to do so I said I'm doing great now let's go home and I came back about a year and a half ago and 
I've gone into people's dealing with people's mental health and well-being. Yeah. Um, started to teach, um, and I was offered. To, I've done panto. I was started as Aladdin, which was quite something for me because I had to sing, which uh, you could probably hear the sound of uh, drowned rats coming all the way from Wales. From where I was <laughs> <up>. <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it was great, and I realised how much I loved being back on stage, but. I thought my time is done now as, as a dancer and then I got the call last summer just as we were going into lockdown um, asking me to return to the stage and uh, headline a show called Here Come the Boys on the West End. Um, Ali Ash, Pasha, Graziano and Karim yeah. and uh, sadly that was supposed to open on the 27th of January this year um, so it's a bit of a bummer because obviously we don't know what's happening as yet. Yeah. Uh, the tour is supposed to be in June. Um, okay. I did say that I will do a share as I'll have a thousand farewells to forward, but this will be my last one. Yeah, yeah. So I loved uh, just hearing that, everything that you were saying. With the um, the mental health side of things and, and, and helping other people, do you think that that is as um, joyful and, and, and helpful and, and fills you with so much fills you up like it like dance does do you do you get that same feeling um not the same but very similar um, obviously yeah. there is nothing like being on stage when that curtain goes up and getting that appreciation of a massive round of applause that's like it's like a drug it is it's it's yeah. addictive um <laughs> and it gives you this sense of oh, i don't know of an electric electricity that goes through your body um yeah when you know that you're helping people on another way it's a warm fuzzy feeling yeah. you know that you've helped that person and yeah. i always said if i could just help one one yeah. person that's that my job is done but i'm now getting addicted to that and i want to help as many people as possible and dancing is good for the mind body and soul um so my aim during this lockdown and the last one is to get as many people up and dancing as possible um yeah. It doesn't solve the problems. It will just put it to one side and you can forget everything for the period that you are dancing. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of people on my like Latin fit classes that I do and um, they're there all the time because they're like, this is our way of letting go once a week. Yeah. And sometimes it's, you know, people need that. Just that that 20 minutes, half an hour a week of, of like you time. Yes. And it's it's so crazy important and I think like you say it's not it's not solving the problem but sometimes it does like either mask the problem for that 20 minutes or it does actually help you compartmentalize sometimes when you've had that time to think you go actually you know I can I can I want to face this now because I've had that me time I've had that you know well, that's been incredible lot, there've been a lot of studies I went into some schools um a couple of years ago um just as a test of thing about the kids that were studying for exams they forced all the kids to stop studying like people didn't want to forced them to come and have a dance lesson um and because they'd switched off for an hour they all then went back to their studying feeling much more enthusiastic about their studying and they were learning more quickly um so it was it was an amazing thing to see what what dance can moving to music can do for someone well it's things like confidence isn't it you know I've so many parents say to me oh you know my kid really loves doing this in their bedroom but you know they won't ever stand on a stage again you you can try all you like but it won't happen and I always say give me a term that's 10 weeks give me a term and I, I can promise you it's going to happen and 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 it does because you you give someone the confidence to believe in themselves and I think um you know the power of that is is incredible well you found during lockdown people don't have to go to studios and do it in front of other people anymore and you can turn your camera off and you can do it in the comfort of your own home where people feel a lot safer um, yeah. and there's a lot more people getting up and dancing men especially they're being dragged to do the class by their other halves and you find that they're like oh my god this is great well don't tell my mates but I'm really really loving this <laughs> yeah yeah and isn't it wonderful that you can get people that ordinarily may have said look I just don't have enough time I just don't have the time to do it or the space or the you know or like I said no I don't want to do that and when you're like you've got the time now you've got the you know and people are just you just do it and you just give it a whirl and the amount of people now that have, have been open to all kinds of like performing arts and creative arts is insane yeah it's it's great you need something during lockdown to 
to switch off and that for me it is is the best thing and i know that i might sound biased because it's what i do but it's just sort of fact really and i'm about to launch um uh, something new to go into um care homes uh wow. and doing some wartime dancing and uh singing because studies have proved that again dancing is amazing for dementia um yeah. people with alzheimer's and dementia i've done a couple of events where we've gone and danced and people were remembering what it was like yeah. in that time just by doing the dance so uh, we're going to start it off as an experiment and then see how it goes i do very something very similar here obviously when we're not in lockdown i go around and i sing to all the the people in the care homes um this one particular care home this lady used to you know introduce herself every time to me and um her carer had said look you know don't take she just doesn't remember you and i'm like that's fine that's fine and then i started singing and she was like you're the singing lady and it was it was wonderful it was wonderful to for somebody to say that and you just think oh my goodness you know and like you like you said there were people in the room who a lot of their carers said look you know that they're very much shut off they don't chat about anything and as soon as they were listening to the music they were swaying and they were saying oh I remember when and they were telling people things and they were like this is incredible and it's just like you say an hour a week an hour a fortnight or whatever and for them it just transports them back to to where the, the places that fond, hold the fondest of memories and that's wonderful to be able to do that yeah and, it's, and that itself is very very rewarding yeah um, yeah when you when you see what happens there was a video the other week about uh, the ballet of someone from the royal i think it was royal ballet that um they were playing swan lake and she was the principal dancer back in the day but she couldn't remember a thing they played it and she started to actually do the routine oh, oh, she hadn't done anything for years and they played it and it was I was just like oh my gosh I was in bits but it just goes to show the power of music and dance yeah, yeah. oh insane and it's like nothing else I think you know it's very it's very much it's very sad how in schools and things it's it's being cut by as a curriculum you know like we actually did dance in school when we when I was in school you know as it was part of the curriculum and music and drama and all these kind of creative arts it all went hand in hand and now it's slowly being pulled and I'm I'm teaching like teenagers who are going oh well I don't I won't get the chance to do that at GCSE if I want to do it further I've got to take it until you know when I'm 16 rather than at, at 13 14 oh, it's a massive shame because it you know it just opens so many doors for people that it's not it doesn't have to be a career it drives me crazy when people say oh well, you know it doesn't have to be this is an enjoyment an outlet a hobby that well, a social activity it doesn't matter whether you're a beginner or a professional whether you're eight or 80 um and dancing is for everybody and you don't have to be like i say to the people on my um fitness classes if you don't get the routines right who cares just keep going and do what you can no one can see you just have fun and for yeah. me, it's all about having fun. Yeah, absolutely. So if you could receive a masterclass in any subject, what do you think the subject would be and who would you like to teach it to you? Um, cooking. I'm going to go for um, uh, Gordon Ramsay because he'd be quite strict. Um, yeah. I can't cook. I cannot cook at all. I'm, I've, I'd burn beans on toast. You know, I'm one of those. Um, and I'd love to be able to cook really good food and um yeah i've been quite fortunate that, that my ex was a chef so um <laughs> a very very good chef uh, wow so that's good I, I used to get like michelin star dinners for dinner every night because <laughs> his his passion was uh cooking um so he would happily do it for me for dinner because that's how he it, it was work for him or it wasn't work for him so I say, so he'd do it for me. It's like when I teach a dance lesson or do some dancing, it's not work. Um, yeah, so yeah. I used to get a spoil. Um, I missed that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm the same. Cooking's not my forte. But I don't enjoy it either. I think that's the problem. Where If you enjoy something, you're, you're more likely to, to give it a go, whereas I don't really. Well, about eight years ago, uh, I decided that I was going to cook Christmas dinner and for the first time and I uh, did everything it was great and the only thing I did all from scratch and the only thing I did from bought from um, a, a well-known supermarket um, was the uh, parsnips okay uh, yeah Fair enough. they came in like a black plastic thingy I chucked them in the top of the oven and it melted all the black plastic and all the black plastic went all over the whole Christmas dinner oh um, stop it I've never attempted to cook again since <laughs> that's 
That's actually heartbreaking. Oh, I'd have been fuming. I wasn't most popular. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to be able to cook properly. I can do meatballs and stuff like that, but I'd love to be able to do property enough there. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. What about a workout playlist? Have you got like a proper, you know, these are the ones that I like? Cheese. Yes. Cheese. Absolutely. 70s music, 90s cheesy pop, Spice Girls, Madonna, Kylie. I'm actually currently working out with the Moulin Rouge uh, Broadway soundtrack in my ears. Um, my best friend is in it, and I was there at the opening night, and it was stunning and by far the best musical I have ever seen on stage. Yeah, oh my, it has to be. Do you know what? I think for me, when I'm working out, I have to have something in there that genuinely, as soon as that turns it on, it makes me smile. Like, yeah. I have to. I, I can't. Doof, doof, doof. Doesn't oh, work. Oh, don't. I, I want a head. I don't want a headache. Like, it just, no, I can't deal. No. It has to be, yeah. It's always steps or something. Yes. Oh, totally. Don't hand for high five to that one. Oh, it has to be. It has to be. It has to be. <laughs> So if you could open a shop, what do you reckon you would sell and what would you call your shop? I would open a shop. I love sticking the stones on the, my shirts. I do them all myself because I love do it. Do you? In fact, if I... I got a little bit bored. <gasps> Stop it. Oh... Uh, you can't quite see it with that hold on. Uh, with a light, here we go. I am seriously impressed. Look at that. Oh my God. So I would sell these basically. Um, and I, uh, it could be, you could have anything stone from swimsuits to uh, anything like that, make it all fancy. And I would call it Stoned by Robin Windsor. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. I, I'm not even joking. I would buy one of those. Yeah, there's about, there's actually about, it's about three, four, five, about 400 stones on that. And that's probably about 40 pounds worth of stones. A couple of hours of my time. Probably go for, I could sell it for 100 pounds, I reckon. If Why you get, not? Because they're proper Swarovski crystals, the one that we, ones that we use on the outfits for Strictly. <coughs> And you used to stick yours on yourself when you did competitions and it all kind of jazz like that. Oh, even like, of course stuff, I did. Even the stuff I wear for shows now, when you stick all the <gasps> stick all the stones on. Oh my god. Yeah, so I could do hats and things like that, and I, I love doing it. It's very therapeutic to stick all the stones on. I'm genuinely not even joking. I am going to be phoning you up and being like, "Can you please <laughs> make me something?" I hate to name drop, but, but, <laughs> um, um, well, I was a couple of years ago, four or five years ago, I was asked by, uh, with Christina Rianoff, we were asked by Eva Longoria to um, do a, a dance at an event in the south of France um, for the ninth richest person in the world. So you can imagine what the party was like. Um, um, I, obviously, Christina being Russian uh, was saying there was pots of caviar on the table and she was like, that little pot there thousands of pounds and they were everywhere it was crazy anyway um we went to do the dress rehearsal of we were dancing actually to the real gypsy kings which was okay. is it, it was the, the the son of the actual guy and yeah. uh even longoria was there uh and just watching it because she'd organized for us to go um and i was, I was like i'm sorry I'm, i can't wear my toss my top at the moment because I've just finished stoning it and the glue's still dry. And she's like, you do it yourself. And I came out in my outfit later. She ran up to me afterwards and said, you really did that? Do you reckon if I gave you a dress, you'd be able to do my dress? And we we never actually got around to doing it, but she, I would have done it. I would have had she come back to me with, with the dress. I'd have done a full dress for her, hip top to bottom. <gasps> oh my God. I'm just like in awe now, genuine, <laughs> in awe, how incredible. And like you say, what a hobby, because that type of thing is very therapeutic. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it, take, it's very, it takes its time and it can get a bit fiddly. Um, but and I'm very anal about them all being the same distance apart as well. Um, just yeah. where CD takes over. Yeah, I mean, like, it's so weird when you're in the creative and everything like that is very much like, no, no. No, no, no. So tell me about somebody you'd love to work with or collaborate with. Is there somebody um, 
particularly that you'd like, oh my goodness, to be able to work with you on a show or a performance or a chat or anything, who would it be? I'm in awe of um, Travis Wall. Um, okay. He was a winner, of, I, don't, I don't think he won, I think he was a uh, runner up on So You Think You Can Dance in America, but he's gone on to some incredible stuff and he's choreographed some ridiculous pieces. Um, he's a brilliant contemporary dancer um, and I admire him very much. Um, and I'd love if, if any if that I mean the possibility of that happening is quite zero really, but um, he's somebody that I admire a very lot. Yeah, amazing. So talk us through lockdown. You kind of like um, touched a little bit on doing some classes and things like that. What's kept you busy during lockdown one, two, and three? Classes really, and I wasn't really that bothered at the beginning. Um, and yeah. I ended up uh, a friend of a friend's uh, daughter uh, couldn't do her birthday party. She said, um, would you do a little bit of a Strictly thing? Um, so I did, and all the mums were watching, and then all the mums said, oh, could we do a class like this every week? And then before I knew it, that was building and building, and a friend of a friend who was in that class, oh, I've got a group of friends that would love this. And before you knew it, I was just run off my feet. Um, yeah. And it was my a flatmate at the time was a, a PT. Um, okay. So we were fighting for the space, too. So we had to have a schedule so that we could have to find room each to be able to do our classes yeah yeah and that's the thing isn't it you have to like really adapt at this time when you when you want to try and do all these sessions you know even just not running them but like attending them you've got to you know yeah I'm having the living room I'm having you can have the dining room in the kitchen and, and all that kind of stuff what about um styles of dance have you ever done any other style of dance or no no I've been born in Latin all my life um but uh being a dancer for so many years I'm very good at mimicking and being able to, if you show me something, as a ballroom dancer, we perhaps don't need to be as flexible as um, other styles of dance. Uh, so I can't put my leg up and do a big old round kick or jump into the splits or anything like that. I've never been able to. Uh, but I can always fudge it to sort of, because we only grew, we grew up doing our ballroom and Latin stuff. Yeah. When I joined Burn the Floor, we had to do Lindy Hop for the first time. Of lifts which we've never been allowed to do things like that so you start to think okay you can get your way through it and over the years you'll find your own way of perfecting it yeah for sure so my last question for you robin is kind of 2021 future goals plans anything in place anything that you want to achieve or are you happy to just roll with it and see what happens well i'm just gonna roll with it and see what happens at the moment i mean um ideally we're going to be back on stage with here come the boys um but um, at the moment, everything's how long is a piece of string? So um, we just have to wait and see. But until then, I'm going to get the country up, get happy, get dancing and see them all online. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for doing that. I mean, I'm sure everybody that's uh, attending the sessions are really, really enjoying themselves. And thank you so much for chatting with me today. I've had a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Robin, for agreeing to chat with me today. I had such a wonderful time. I'm sending every one of you watching this my very best wishes. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again soon for another fantastic.